last one in this session and we are moving in time. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Roma from Atomic Energy Center, France. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope I will be as good as the other speakers in uh, respecting the time. Uh, so I'm working at CEA, where we are in a department uh, for nuclear materials. We are interested in radiation damage uh, in materials. And silicon carbide is one of uh, the insulating materials that has been considered for application as a cladding of uh, nuclear fuel, and so uh, it, it has been studied. Uh, the, the radiation damage in this material uh, has been characterized in many ways, trying to understand what happens in different uh, conditions of uh, doses, temperatures uh, of your radiation. And here is a summary. Uh, so which one is the pointer here? This one? Yes, OK. So uh, this is a summary uh, from this paper here, uh, Journal of Nuclear Materials, uh, where people have tried to characterize damage as a function of uh, temperature and fluence. And as uh, I must uh, remind to this audience that uh, when I'm talking of low temperature spheres, uh, in the case of your, uh, silicon carbide, it doesn't mean 4 Kelvin, but uh, 400 degrees C. Uh, where uh, silicon carbide uh, amorphizes below 400 degrees C uh, at certain fluences, uh, generally at uh, low temperature and high fluence, uh, silicon carbide amorphizes. But at higher temperature, people have tried to characterize what uh, is left uh, in the non-amorphized material. And apart from larger structure, these location loops, there are these uh, uh, small uh, called small loop or, or uh, I mean, unidentified black spots. And uh, it is, would be interesting to try to characterize, uh, to understand what are these things. Uh, of course, you have any kinds of defects which are created under radiation, vacancy interstitials, and their evolution during, during irradiation is a, a question that has to be solved. So, um, this slide probably was not necessary for this audience uh, because uh, I think most of you know what are the experimental ways to characterize uh, defects, point defects in semiconductor or insulators. But it was to stress the fact that uh, uh, you have, oh sorry, that uh, every technique is limited to some kinds of defects, typically, for example, EPR to uh, spin unpaired. Uh, uh, unpaired spins in, in defects, or uh, in other cases, you need to have uh, uh, defect levels in the band gap, which is not always the case for point defects, and, and for larger defects also. And uh, for positron annihilation, for example, is uh, limited to vacancies, cavities, where positrons have a larger uh, lifetime. And, uh, and other techniques uh, involve uh, the, the specific uh, phonon signature of, of defects, for example, through phonon satellites in photoluminescence. And uh, with Raman, uh, people have used quite a lot Raman spectroscopy in the recent years to try to characterize damage in silicon carbide and in other materials, but in particular silicon carbide. And uh, with Raman, one probes the phonons, uh, at least in certain conditions, as I, as I will uh, show later. And these are a couple of uh, plots from different papers uh, where some colleagues were involved of uh, Raman uh, spectra of uh, irradiated silicon carbide. Here you have a, a scan in, in depth where you see the place where larger damage uh, is, and here where you still see uh, the main peak uh, of, the, of the bulk. Uh, here I don't remember, I think probably here it was a, a, a 6C silicon carbide, I'm not sure, but uh, as I, I will show you later the, the difference between the different polytypes of silicon carbide from uh, point of view of the spectrum. In, 
there are features like this, for example, which has typically been associated to carbon-carbon bonds. And uh, here, what happens uh, in the spectrum after irradiation has been attributed to silicon-silicon bonds or to activated bulk modes due to the uh, release of symmetry. Uh, it, what is interesting is that uh, this kind of thing, for example, uh, doesn't uh, show up in all um, uh, in all um, uh, irradiation uh, types. For example, here where you have mostly uh, damage creating the electronic regime, uh, these peaks are not observed, at, at least not clearly as here. And so the question is, what kind of defects are creating these things? Now, uh, before going to the specifics of uh, uh, calculation of Raman spectra from first principle DFT calculations, I want to show the context in which this has been done. And for this, I show you a proof of concept. I mean, it's not just uh, there are real calculation, what I'm showing you in the next slide. Uh, but, uh, as you will see in the, le in the rest of my talk, uh, there is a lot of uh, precautions to be taken before uh, interpreting this and uh, limiting this to only certain defects that uh, might be uh, relevant. So, the idea is we calculate from ab initio formation and migration energies and reaction energies of defects, for example, recombination between vacancies and interstitials. And we input them in some kinetic model. Here I've done it with some uh, homogeneous chemical kinetics. One, in principle, could take into account spatial effects with the Venn kinetic Monte Carlo. One can add a, a source term for creation of defects, for example, through Frankel pair creation. And uh, from this, uh, you get some uh, uh, concentration with time. And with this concentration, you can weight some spectra. In this case, I calculated from ab initio some uh, spectra, Raman spectra of uh, supercell containing defects, and I weighted the different defects with these concentrations, and then you could try to uh, um, compare to experiment. Now, an example of this is in this slide. So you start from here, time zero, uh, where you switch on irradiation, the concentration of some defects are growing, some other are start to go down when you have, for example, recombination of vacancies and interstitials. And at the beginning, uh, at time, at a low time, you have your spectra of, which is basically the concentration are, are low enough so that you are uh, looking at uh, essentially the spectrum of the pure material. And then as you go up in time, you start to see the effect of defects. Here, as you see, you can have vacancies, interstitial, and other kind of defects, anticytes. And uh, you start to get something which uh, looks like, qualitatively, like irradiated uh, silicon carbide spectra. Uh, now, as I said, uh, there are a lot of uh, questions before uh, being able to compare this to experiment. This is just a proof of concept. And so I go to the way we did the calculations. The idea is uh, perturbation theory. And uh, essentially, uh, it can be shown that uh, the Raman tensor uh, in, at first order, which is important point, uh, is uh, related to uh, the derivative of the polarizability, which is a third derivative of energy. This is a second derivative of the polarizability with respect to fields, and the third derivative if we add a derivative with respect to phonon modes, phonon eigenvectors. Uh, so the Raman tensor can be calculated thanks to the 2n plus 1 theorem, uh, which uh, says that you can calculate the third derivative of energy well, the 2n plus 1 derivative of energy, knowing only the nth derivative of the wave functions, the electron wave functions. And this has been shown for the case of Raman spectra uh, by Lazier and Maori in 2003. So we, we use this framework, which is implemented in uh, Quantum Espresso, uh, this code here. 
And uh, as a first example, I show you the pure materials, the uh, three polytypes, most well-known polytypes of silicon carbide, 4H polytype, the 6H polytype, and then I will show you the cubic one. And uh, here I compare to the very first uh, uh, measurements done uh, when the lasers were available in 68. And uh, I compare them with the same light polarization that were used here, which is are, are important in order to switch on or off certain lines due to symmetry. And you can see that the agreement is uh, quite good. Here, for example, here you have uh, E2 lines, which is much smaller, that is true. Here you have an E2 line that uh, is not appearing here, but this is explained because uh, it shouldn't appear here. And by the way, the authors were saying that this line was appearing only due to the large angle of the monochromator at that time. I suppose that now one can do in such a way that it doesn't appear. And the comparison of the 4H and uh, 3C polytype, if we consider the equivalent direction, that is the Z direction of uh, the 4H polytype correspond to the 111 direction of the cubic one, then you can see the, 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 comp the, the spectra are very similar. The only difference is a splitting of this peak here and uh, these small peaks here. Now, uh, here, in order to compare to experiment, I reversed the scale. In the following plots, the scale uh, of frequencies are the, the normal one from zero uh, to a higher frequency and from uh, right to left, from, from left to right. So this, uh, quickly on this, just to remind that when we are calculating, uh, ah, yes, sorry, I had to say something here it's important. The approximation is valid only if the laser frequency is much larger than the phono frequencies and much smaller and smaller than the gap of the material. This is not always the case in defects. One has to take a, 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 a pay attention to the fact that one has, for example, here a, a charge transition level. Then in order to observe first order transitions, uh, Raman transitions uh, for uh, for these defects, one should have a, a laser a laser frequency which is smaller than than this uh, distance from here to the valence band. So this is a, a very important question because many defects uh, are not in this regime uh, for the commonly used laser frequencies. Uh, here is an example of a defect calculation. Uh, it's the the VC CSI carbon vacancy carbon anti site. Uh, uh, complex uh, where I want just to show that the Raman spectrum is very different from the simple vibrational density of state. But we will come back to this later. Now another point is that you can have all defects in all possible orientation that are allowed by the symmetry of the crystal and so this we averaged uh, in some cases uh, on this, and, and we can see there, there is a difference between averaging on uh, defect orientation and uh, taking only one specific ones. Uh, I want to stress that this is not the same as averaging of on the polarization of light on the whole solid angle. It's a different thing. So we can still distinguish from different por uh, light polarization. And here I have to show you an embedding procedure in order because we are doing calculation for relatively small supercells, 64 atoms, sometimes 216. But then we embed it, we embed the force constants in much larger supercells of bulk. And so we can reach this size. And one point which is interesting, that uh, the, 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 the comparison of different size of, of this embedding procedure is that bulk uh, uh, peaks are raising when you raise the supercells because they are proportional to the size of the supercells. But defects uh, signatures, for example this one, as you are diminishing the concentration of your defect in supercell, they are going down. So this helps you distinguish in what are simply the, the the, 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 the bulk uh, modes which are perturbed by, by, by the defects and what are really the, the, the signature of the defects. 
Here's another case, which is, the, again, the VCCSI complex. Here it's uh, much, the, 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 the intensities are much larger because the, before it was a carbon antisite, which uh, has a small perturbation, relatively small on the Raman spectrum. And here the perturbation on the Raman spectrum is much, much larger, probably because we are in a case where you have a defect level and uh, the, the modifications, we are close to the problems with the, with the Platzek approximation. Uh, before showing you the last defects, which are anti-side pairs, I want to justify why we are looking at that, because through some uh, kinetic simulation that we did in 2010, we have shown that uh, the, if we do uh, evolution of defect concentrations from uh, a reasonable concentration that you can have after irradiation, uh, and uh, we look at the uh, recombination of defects and the evolution of the concentrations, uh, it changes a lot if the vacancy has the metastable uh, configuration, which is known for silicon carbide, or the stable one, which is the VCCSI. And in that case, you are forming antisites, and in particular, antisite pairs. So if we look at antisite pairs, uh, which are the defects uh, here, uh, you uh, can have some metastable configuration, which we have studied in, also in 2010, here, which can occur under irradiation. And we can compare the, the Raman signature of these. This is for the anti-side pair, so relatively small uh, um, uh, in influence, uh, but if we look uh, for the same concentration at these two uh, coordination defects, uh, which are similar to stone whales defects in graphite, then you have much, much larger uh, influence. So defects which are apparently not very far from one another because they are just metastable configurations uh, one of the other, they can have very different Raman signatures. Now, I go to the conclusions, uh, and uh, I just want to stress, uh, this is essentially a summary, but I, something which I didn't stress during the presentation is that neither carbon antisites nor this complex, nor antiside pairs, have any signature above uh, 100, 1,100 centimeters to minus one although they have carbon-carbon bonds. So this cannot be responsible for those peaks at 1,400, uh, 500 that I showed you in the experimental uh, uh, spectra. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have time only for one question. <laughs> Again, the same person asks a question. <laughs> How, how does it work in bedding procedure when you have a, a defect? How you impose a, or a reconciliate the periodic boundary conditions of the uh, lattice and the small region that you are studying where you have your defect use green functions? Or how is that done? No, it's just, uh, it's just uh, matching. Well, I, I substitute essentially the, 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 all the atoms uh, in the defect cell, I'm, uh, I have to pay attention that the defect is in the center of the, of the supercell, because otherwise it should be possible, but it's a bit more complicated. And uh, so I, I have to identify one by one the, the atoms that are in the supercell with those uh, which are in the, bulk per, in the perfect uh, bulk cell, perfect bulk supercell, which I can uh, built because th thanks to K points, uh, to Q points, I can do very large bulk supercells, but I cannot do uh, very large defect supercells. They would have the defects or, or, uh, repeated, so I don't, I'm not interested in that. And uh, so I match all the atoms for the defect supercell. Uh, if you have a vacancy, for example, I have to remove one atom which is in the bulk because it is not in, in the... So it's uh, sometimes a bit tricky, but... The, uh, here I've not considered uh, um, um, volume relaxation. 
We have no more time, but uh, so? your discussions can be during <laughs> lunch. Uh, before finishing the session, I would like to give some small comment. Comparing with other conferences where I took part, I see the advantage of this organization that every participant can listen to any of the talks. Of course, it gives, uh, there are no cross, session, uh, cross sections of sections. It's, from my point of view, it's advantage. Disadvantage, it's strict rules for talks, for questions, but advantage is that everybody can listen to uh, all the uh, talks. So, Christopher, I approve this idea. Uh, so, we finish, and next um, will be a two o'clock, invited speaker, uh, and good appetite. <laughs> Thank you again. Merci beaucoup.